go. Look. Now maybe you want to test the sound. Bit loud? No. Or do you want it to? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll write it. Um, you write it from there. And for am I wearing this? Yeah. Good question. I should ask the technician. Okay. Uh, we have two or three, don't we? And it might be enough that it's just here on the glass. Both of them on. Up. Do we have some kind of balance? Or? Up too. Yeah. Can you hear me, Sean? <laughs> yeah. And this one, if you could give him a bit of a sound check. That might be a little too, too complex. Yeah, okay. Um, is, is, there, is it being live streamed? Yeah, it's streamed from the back anyway. It's just oh, okay. Bonus, so oh, I see. Don't, don't worry um, if it's going to disrupt your computer, because I know what Zoom video is like. So. That's true. Hmm. Yeah, don't worry about that. Um, okay. Yeah, may, maybe if I had ten, 10 minutes, I could. No, no, no. Let's, let's not do it. Okay. They can watch on the YouTube. Uh, on 
Tuesday we had um, the software consortium. Yesterday we had the workshop. It all went really well. It's quite exciting and a concept and aim. It's brilliant. But I'm Thor Maxson. I'm a professor here at the University of Perth. And I'm a research professor at the ISAM University of the Arts, where I run a project called Intelligent Instruments. And some of the people in this room are, are key members of that lab. So this is Chris Peter, my colleague here at Perfect. And the two labs, uh, Intelligent Instruments Lab and the Enius Lab that we run here at Perfect, are kind of collaborating and working on this conference. So yeah, welcome to Brighton and to Perfect this beautiful campus, which is all in like a building zone at the moment, as you've seen. But um, we're here to run the first kind of live instance of uh, AIMC for many years. It's been online because of the pandemic for many years, and now we're coming together, which is great. And at the end of this, um, at the end of tomorrow, I think we'll hear about where it's going to be held next year. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Intelligent Instruments Lab and then hand over to Chris. So the lab that we run in Iceland is an ERC-funded project for five years and where we build instruments with AI. And that's kind of AI in a, in a broad sense. We're interested in instruments that have some kind of agency and responses and do funny things that we enjoy playing with, creating a certain type of adaptive instrument that is engaging and and deepening somehow, you know, we, 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 we start to create this kind of relationship with instruments through this kind of um, algorithm. And of course we do that with acoustic <coughs> instruments, but we're exploring what it means to add AI to physical instruments. And we're very much thinking about the perception of AI. How do we deal with that? How do we feel about that? But um, and in this lab, we we, um, we do all kinds of work, and you can see it on the website and GitHub, and we had a workshop yesterday with some of this technology. And Chris, you're going to talk a little bit about the Enius lab. Well, thanks. Uh, I'd like to reiterate Thor's welcome. Uh, so Enius lab at Strathic is a kind of umbrella for people who are doing research related to music technology. And it, it goes across campus from schools, but mainly sits in music and media. Uh, we're really interested in a kind of big theme, but one of which is, is AI, of course. Uh, we do a lot of work with feedback instruments, with instrument design, and live coding. But AI underpins a lot of these things. And it comes from some strong roots at Suffolk in uh, artificial life and complexity and dynamical system studies, which so we kind of look at that side of dynamic AI, which fits into live performance systems. I just want to do a, a few stats about the conference. So we, in our main tracks, which were the papers, demos, doctoral consortium, performances, installations, we had 75 submissions. Uh, we accepted after lots of discussions on open review. We uh, accepted 52 of those. So we had about 70% acceptance rate. And uh, we also had nine, or we'll be having nine alt AIMC papers which was a separate track to encourage kind of late breaking research and perhaps work that explores more controversial or provocative ideas. But on all those papers will be in the same session. Uh, we've got about 85 people registered for the conference and about 15 in the crew, so we're about 100 people. Uh, I'd like to, we've also got 15 of those people online, roughly, and uh, we've got Ray here, who is our kind of in-person avatar, if that's the word, for the online people. So I'd like to ask uh, if, you, if you're presenting in a uh, poster session and Ray comes and answers some questions, it might be on behalf of the people who are on the Zoom room. So he's going to be wandering around with Zoom and his mobile phone and kind of representing people who aren't in person here. Uh, so we hope that's going to work all right. Uh, the campus, just some quick information. So. We made a decision to try and keep the ticket price low by not including food, but there's plenty of food on campus. So there's a campus info page, which you've probably already seen on the website, showing where you can find food and coffee and so on on campus. Uh, we've also got 
a public Discord channel if you've got questions. And so if you need help with anything, find someone in a blue t-shirt and we'll do our best to help you out. Uh, one last thing. So we'd like to use uh, as a kind of back channel for thinking about the academic work at the conference, there's a pretty good commenting system on PubPub. So what we'd like to do is encourage people, if you've got questions for authors and presenters outside of the poster sessions, uh, please, or comments on their work, please use PubPub. Uh, the idea is this will give us a lasting public record of what's happened at the conference, rather than it being left on a Discord channel somewhere. So we hope that's going to work all right. And now I'm going to hand back to Yeah, so we're very much looking forward to today. So I've had the concert in the evening, and tomorrow night we go to Brighton um, and Kastan, Kast, uh, where we uh, will uh, have an algorithm and there will be food there, um, canteen for us. Uh, but uh, just to finish up, um, I'd like to thank the team that's been so busy organizing this conference, and that's uh, in ad addition to the conference chairs of us. We have the scientific chair, Ivo uh, Sundström and Jack Armitage. Uh, we have installation and demo chairs, Cécile Gaudier, uh, Steve Simons, and Sam Bilbo. We have performance chairs, Evelyn Sicara and uh, Nicola Privatso. Doctoral symposium chairs, John Reus and Dimitris Kiriakoudi. Auditorium chairs, again, Dimitris. And then we have tutorials and work chairs. Chair, uh, and also the AIMC steering committee for all the good advice and the work that they've been kind of supporting us with during the planning of this conference which has been taking many, many, many months. So thank you. Let's give these good people a good clap. <coughs> and now we're going to hand over to Dadabo. Aha, thank you so much. And she will kind of make sure that it's on time. She might give you five minutes time or something mm. and take questions afterwards. So. Oh, wonderful. And uh, what time should I, do I wrap up? 10.30, is that right? Uh, yes. OK, wonderful. Hey, everyone. I am CJ. I am one half of Databots, an AI death metal research band. I'm, I'm also head of audio at Harmony, which is an uh, open source neural synthesis lab building large base models for music um, supported by uh, the Stability AI GPU cluster. <laughs> um, so yeah, AI death metal. Uh, what does that sound like? <laughs> okay, so wh what you're listening to right here, this is a 24-7 live streaming generative neural net that's been running for four years straight, generating nothing but death metal in this one style. 
<laughs> um, and every time I log in, it's doing something totally different. I've never heard that before. <laughs> That's so weird. <laughs> OK. Um, so uh, contrary to po popular belief, we are musicians. Here is some evidence of me singing in a band. Uh, here's me playing guitar. Um, and, but w way, way before we got into neurosynthesis, we were making uh, SoundCloud bots using classical MIR techniques. Um, our most popular one was auto chiptune. And so a SoundCloud bot goes and spiders SoundCloud looking for music to remix, automatically remixes it in 30 seconds, posts it, comments on the previous track, um, and kind of just runs relentlessly uh, like spam until it gets banned. So this was previously a folk song um, that's now been auto chip tuned. Um, but around 2016, it suddenly became obvious that making raw audio music with neural nets was tractable. So audio, as you all know, is a sequence of amplitudes. So any machine learning model that can generate a sequence can generate audio. Um, and the very first experiments uh, of this using deep learning uh, were WaveNet, which is here, um, where you have convolutional net uh, layers predicting, given the past context, what's going to come next. Um, and you also had sample RNN, um, which is a recurrent neural net predicting individual samples at the sample rate. So that could be 16 kilohertz or 48 kilohertz, 48,000 decisions per second. Very overkill, but also extremely powerful. Uh, when this first came out, it was Mila Research in uh, University of Montreal, and they were doing unconditional speech generation. Um, later, that team made Lyrebird and uh, text-to-speech. But we were interested in taking their research and doing it for first acapellas. So we tried, as our data set, an, uh, all of the Nirvana Kurt Cobain acapellas. And our first results that we heard, uh, we thought maybe it would be noise or silence or some kind of glitch. But no, it screamed. And it screamed Jesus. And Zach and I looked at each other, our, our hearts palpitating. We're like, should we be doing this? That's when we knew that <laughs> we were onto something, and also that this is kind of a dark art. Um, so normally, if you're a band, your tech stack looks like this. You have instruments and amplifiers and tuners. But as an AI band, this is your stack. <laughs> you're logging into SSH onto an AWS machine to run PyTorch and Theano scripts in Python and do a lot of data set processing with FFmpeg. Um, we uh, were lucky enough to, um, as a result of competing in a hackathon, get access to $100,000 worth of GPU credits on Amazon. And with that, we, we just trained t like hundreds of sample RNNs looking for the right combination of hyperparameters where it could make good music. And we published a paper at uh, NIPS 2017 on how to do that. <laughs> but, you know, most most people are trying to make pop music or classical music in this field. At the, and we were like, um, let's, let's try to go beyond that and just do like niche genres that we like, like math rock and black metal. And here are some of the examples. We um, published our output on, as albums on Bandcamp. The first thing we, we did was this thing called Deep the Beatles, where we trained it on the Beatles discography. And here you'll hear what sample RNN sounds like as it's training. So right in the beginning, it sounds like total noise. <laughs> At 
the unsculpted mind. After a couple days of training, it sounds a little bit more like instruments. And then after a few days of training, it starts sounding more. It sounds more like music. You hear drums, bass, singing, John, well, John Lennon, McCartney, like all those timbres are in there. Um, it's not exactly good at tempo or keeping structure, sound structure is like a drunken walk, as iron ends do, but like the timbres are all there. Um, and we also, we, yeah, we put out a paper at Ollie Bones Conference, Moom, 2018, about how, um, the process of making an entire deep fake album, what that, what that would be like. And one of these albums went viral, and it was our black metal album, Codipney of Timeness. <laughs> um, like critics on the internet started listening to it and like rating it as if it was music. They didn't rate it very good, but we're actually <laughs> surprised that people thought it was music. Um, so here's the needle drop. We made a video of, of listening to the album, and here's his reaction. Let's have a listen. We, we beat the black metal Turing test. <laughs> um, and critics were like, um, what saves this album compared to the other releases of random output <laughs> was that we actually made a, an attempt to present the material in an enjoyable context. Um, which turns out, <laughs> if you take your output and put it in a musical form, people will listen to it. <laughs> um, and so yeah, we were, we were impressed. And we, you know, we, the training data for that album was this black metal album by Kralis. It was The Sacrificial Lamb. And we hadn't asked permission from that band. So we thought, okay, we should probably reach out to them. Um, like, hi, we trained a network on your album. We used it to generate this other album. Let us know if you want us to take it down, if we misrepresented your art. And they responded, no, 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 actually, we really liked it. It didn't misrepresent us all. Um, they thought it was awesome enough to do more collaborations, and we did. <laughs> so, like, okay, we're unstoppable. Let's just keep training it on our, on our fav favorite albums. Um, so, so we trained it on Mashuga, which is this math metal band. And I know some of y'all are fans of Mashuga because we were talking about it last night. Um, <laughs> so Mashuga, they are um, a band with weird type signatures, but always this constant groove. But now, when you have an RNN generated, there's no constant groove. It's just like this drunken walk of riffs. And it sounds really interesting. Who here is a fan of Meshuggah? Oh, whoa, okay. That's like a very high, highest ratio of, of hands I've ever actually seen. Okay, um, how does that sound compared to Meshuggah? 
<laughs> sounds pretty close, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's not like we're just hitting enter and the music comes out and we're very lazy about it. Um, we have to do a lot of curating. And like a single model, we might generate 10 hours of music we have to listen through to find those good bits that will then assemble into an album. And it's really hard to listen through 10,000 hours of, of music. So we made a, this app called the Dome, the Disproportionately Oversized Music Explorer. <laughs> and it gives me a bird's eye view on the left and a big scroll on the right. And I can look through the spectrogram to find cool parts. Um, yeah, so we, we kind of became content creators. And we're doing like 80% content creation, 20% research. And it was really fun. Um, one of the next things we tried was a skate punk. Uh, and so we found, like, we tried a bunch of genres, and those early models were really good at genres where noise was okay. So metal and punk, um, like, the, no the noisier, the grittier. It, so it sounds really good. Uh, and also, they have a really reduced range of timbre. On that one album, I have like, all the same instruments, all the same production style. It's actually like the perfect data set. We tried things like hip hop and electronic music, and it would just not train to a point where you could listen to it. But punk, it could do. Um, <laughs> so we took NoFX's album, Punk and Drublick, and we made a parody called Bot Brownies. And one of our fans on YouTube made a lyric video. So this is still, we're using unconditional generation, so it doesn't know anything about language. We're just hearing s random syllables of singing. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, th this fan came up with the lyrics that he thought he was hearing <laughs> and made this video. <laughs> Great fun. Uh, it also works for free jazz. So we, we made a deep fake John Coltrane album called Outer Helios. Um, and we t may have lied to the press and said that this was live streaming from space. <laughs> um, and they may not have changed it. <laughs> since <laughs> yes, it was. That's right. <laughs> we said it was streaming from Voyager 3. <laughs> um, but like, making albums was, was a lot of fun. But uh, like, when we're doing this, like, we can invent like, a whole totally new format for this kind of stuff. Like, why not have an infinite generator live streaming on YouTube? Um, so that's what we did. And, um, like, f f but not, not every neural net that we trained can do that. Actually, almost all of them are, would be pretty bad if you just were li to listen to them continually. But we sort of lucked out with one, and we trained it on Archspire, this technical death, band, uh, death metal band from c Canada. Um, and everything that the neural net was making sounded great. Like I could put it on, study, fall asleep, like listen to it for six hours, and I still haven't gotten tired. So I'm like, all right, let's just sh share it and see what happens. Um. Wow, 
so calming. Um, uh, somehow Vice found this and, did, and it like blew up and like two million people showed up and there was this chat room and I know some of you were in this chat room uh, and like people are still here. It's been, it's been running for four years um, and what's been kind of fascinating from an anthropological point of view is that people have their long distance relationships in here. I like look through the history of it, no joke, in like five or six different languages like there'll be two people, a couple there for like an hour or two having <laughs> a date <laughs> in the death metal generator. Uh, I would love to meet these people. <laughs> um, so the, yeah, the infinite radio, it's kind of like a glorified wind chime. Uh, wind chimes, they, you set the initial conditions and let nature run its course. Um, same exact thing with the AI generators. Um, wind chimes have been doing it long before. Uh, <laughs> so during pandemic, lots of concerts were live streamed. Here we are still playing at MathCore Index Fest 2021. I went the following year, and they were like, hey, he's still playing at the last year. Um, but what, one of the problems with the, the, like, these generators is that if I die or stop paying the AWS bill, it will stop running. And that's a problem if I want this piece to run forever. So I've been coming up with solutions to do it in a decentralized way, where if I die, it'll still make music. Um, and I can think of like a, f a few different protocols for that that have various trade-offs. Uh, so if like decentralized engineering is kind of your thing, I would lo also love to brainstorm. Um, another thing you could do besides the infinite generator is just like make a ton of songs. So we, were, we collaborated with this uh, emo band, Silverstein. We made 1,000 songs and each listener like gets one song. No one can listen to a hundred, uh, a thousand songs, but like if you get your one special song, that's your, that's your song. Uh, another example where just like the, everything the model was making sounded great for some reason. Um, so, okay. I'm going to let you in on, on a secret. If you are a machine learning researcher in music, it is very easy to cold email artists you respect and be like, yo, I'm, so I make like cool AI technology. Do, do you want to do a collaboration? And for us, the success ratio of that is like astoundingly high. More, way higher than approaching a musician as like a session bassist. <laughs> like, get in line, kid. Bass, come on. But if you're like, I have the ability to make an infinite generator, then people want to work with you. And so one like, really cool artist we got to work with was Reap's One, the UK beatbox champion. Um, and we built him a neural net trained on his beatboxing that he battles. And we made a music video about it. Check it out.
That was so fun to make this. Um, and we went off to make this uh, performance at Ars Electronica. Um, and uh, Reap's one has, he calls this his second self. And he likens it to a sparring partner that helps him up his own game, makes him better at his own craft. And I liken this to this term, about adversarial human learning. <laughs> um, and music is not the only place that we're seeing this. Uh, turns out that AlphaGo has been forcing humans to get better at Go. And this is, this is great news. Um, we, sh we should think of our big, scary, uh, like AI existential threat as something that is a, like a healthy adversary hardening us and making us even better at, at what we do. OK. Um, uh, th we're still in the history part of our talk. So uh, a, couple, a couple years ago, OpenAI Jukebox came out. Who's used Jukebox? Yeah, it's so fun. Uh, so th this one was, is the first large music model. And it takes 24 hours to generate one song. But it knows about 800 genres. Um, and it's lyrics conditioned. So before all the Drake fakes, you could make deep fakes with Jukebox. Like this one that I made of Frank Sinatra singing Toxic by Britney Spears. OK, guess what happened next? <laughs> um, it was from uh, bots representing the estate of Frank Sinatra, I think. <laughs> um, and because something like this had, hadn't happened before, as far as, far as I know, uh, and because we're in the interest as artists, like just poking the world and see what happens, we're like, what if we fight this? What, what would happen? Um, so I got a whole bunch of press, and we got some help from the EFF. Uh, they helped send us some people pro bono. And they were like, this is probably fair use, because you know you guys are non-commercial, and it's transformative, so, and you're doing it for educational purposes, so let's, let's try it. Fair use argument. And run, drum roll, yeah, I got to read. We, we got the copyright strike overturned, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, Frank Sinatra, Toxic lives on. And interestingly enough, like, I, I'm not sure wh what kind of agreement happened. It's sort of behind closed doors. Um, but now the video is being automatically monetized. And Britney Spears gets the publishing royalties for writing the lyrics, and then we get the recording royalties for generating it, and then Frank Sinatra's estate doesn't get anything. <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. Um, and also, like, Frank Sinatra's estate is part of this YouTube AI music incubator now, and I just have a whole lot of questions that don't really have answers, and, but that's okay, as, as one does in art. So one, one of the coolest things that Jukebox introduced, um, being the first large music model, is that you could combine genres to make brand new genres. Here's some jukebox settings that I, I love. It's combining funk, deathcore, and gent. Um, all these genres are at around the same tempo. They all, they all have this, the backbeat. They're both groovy. Um, so they actually fuse together really well. Uh, have you guys seen this site, Every Noise at Once? Very popular site. 5,000 Spotify genres all in one TSNE map, I think, or UMAP. There's all kinds of genres in here. Uh, I love this freaking site. But like, what, what if this was the interface? What if you were controlling a neural synth by finding points on this map between the genres? 
you know, what if this was, um, yeah, what, what if this is a, a way to combine genres or go, go to places on the map like where humans haven't explored yet? And so, he, yeah, here's some examples of fusions. So this is funk and samba together. Crazy. Um, you hear like that kind of bass line of, of funk and the horns and samba. Um, yeah, there's nothing more exciting to me than exploring the power set of all possible combinations of genres. Because the, the power set, there's, there's more co possible combinations than there are particles in the universe. It's kind of insane. Uh, this one, what did I, this one's this. Uh, Satanic Tropical House Latin Trap Jazz. I love just seeing the model struggle to fuse these like different different concepts together, um, and like through a lot of experimenting, we are going to find amazing genres in there that have, no one has heard of before, <laughs> and there will be a whole culture subcultures built around them. It's going to be awesome. Um, one of the cool things you can do as a music group that is using AI is join the AI song contest. Um, I think some of you people here have been judges. Who, ha who has been a part of this? Oh, cool. OK, well, um, I think last year there was almost 100, or 50 to 100 teams. Uh, the deadline is Tuesday, I think. If, it might be yeah, cutting a little short if you wanted to join. But um, I think this is one of like, the best shelling points for a confluence of people making the models and the artists um, coming up with stuff. And super, super cool. I recommend checking out all these songs. Uh, also, each part of each submission, you build a, um, you write a process document and you explain exactly what you did. Uh, and re reading those is very enlightening. <laughs> One year, our submission, we tried to like ha do the least amount of effort possible. So we made this uh, thing, <laughs> this album called Can't Play Instruments. Volume one. Uh, with song titles like We Generated This Album in Our Sleep, Our Musicianship Has Completely Atrophied, and My Calluses Are So Soft It Hurts to Turn the Amp On. Uh, here is our entry from last year, and I'm going to play this whole song because the video is also shows us uh, shows you guys the, the process, and we use like ten or twelve different methods in it. Um,
so that that process was you know generating a bunch of assets, MIDI, mostly audio, sticking it together in Ableton. Using neural synthesis as a sample generator is just OP, overpowered. Other cool artists are doing really, really interesting things in the space. Uh, Holly Herrington released her voice as a model uh, that people are free to remix. And you do like a 50-50 split with her. Um, and uh, it's really fun. Here I am, yeah, running some Baroque MIDI through her voice. Which is super cool. And then um, earlier this year, Grimes did a similar thing and um, has been really popular. And there's a lot of cool Grimes remixes. Um, hmm. OK. Before I bring you to all the cool diffusion stuff and 2023 neural synthesis research, I'm just going to take a quick detour into symbolic. Um, has anyone here used Guitar Pro? Yeah. OK. So I made a, a encoder, decoder that converts Guitar Pro files into a set of tokens that you can train language models on. Um, and yeah, I, I work with some students at QML uh, on this. <laughs> so he, here's what the, but no training, just like if you just do random tokens. Uh, sounds like this. Um, and d designing a, a token system is actually like a super interesting problem. Um, and I wanted to make it so that anything out of distribution would always compile still to a guitar profile. And, um, and it, yeah, it took a ton of iterations and thinking about how exactly to, to do that. But the fact that I just do random tokens and still you get something <laughs> like, <whoa. laughs> like this. Nope. OK. Um, but you can also train it. So this has been trained on. This one's been yeah trained on Michelangelo Badio and a bunch of speed metal guitarists and is now generating a solo. Uh, and you know, back to this concept of human adversarial learning. Uh, can we get human musicians to try to play this stuff? And yes, we can. I think it's just cool. Like, I'm so interested in hearing what, like, what, what do neural nets sound like for themselves? Not try to imitate pop music to try to top the charts, but make something new and then also forcing humans to try to learn it too is, is pretty fun. All right. So neural synthesis in 2023. Uh, for large base models, there's really two main paradigms right now. Uh, you're both starting with a VAE that learns some latent space of audio. You're starting from a neural audio codec, and it's either discrete or continuous. Continuous VAEs are the traditional ones. The discrete VAEs are vector quantized. Um, and there's also some mixturing you can do. Like you can train a discrete VAE and then remove the code books, and now it's continuous again. Um, you can also use discretification as a regularizer on a continuous VE. But in any sense, you end up with either a latent space that is discrete, which you can train language models on, like Transformer, and you get things like Music LM and Music Gen, uh, or you're uh, training a continuous VE, where you can do things like latent diffusion. Um, 
And as you guys probably know, music generally is a little bit slower to innovate than language, image, and speech. Um, but the awesome thing about that is any advance that's ha happening in those fields is, can like, usually be readily applied. Um, so as a music researcher, we're, con uh, we're constantly reading papers like, in these other domains, looking for things that we can apply. Like um, flash attention was this recent one that just you know, helped make transformers be a lot more efficient. <laughs> and it's like, oh, OK, let's just plug that into our music models. And like, oh my god, the VRAM went way, way down. That's cool. Um, so if, you are, if you're stuck for ideas, look, look there. Um, there's also different amounts of GPUs that different groups are using. So there are huge groups in the industry that have tens of thousands of GPUs plus, like Google, Meta, Stability. Um, and their kind of focus is making these large base models. And when those are open source, then the rest of us can use them, which is awesome. And that is also where I'm currently positioned, and, and Harmony is m making these large base models for all of you guys to, to work with once we release them. Um, if you're a startup, there's like things you can apply to, especially if you're an accelerator, where you can get hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of cloud credits for GPU research. I've done this three times already. Um, and it's uh, yeah, also a great way to get a ton of GPU power to, to do your research, even if yeah, your end goal is not necessarily to yeah, make a bunch of business. Um, and if you're also GPU starved, or you're at an institution that maybe has like eight or a dozen, dozens of GPUs, um, then you maybe right now not folk making large base models. Instead, you're looking at research like inference and fine tuning data sets, thinking of interfaces, or just making sick music. Um, and there's a lot of important research that still needs to be done um, constantly. When uh, like e e even like if you have a base model, um, like with image, you know we have stable diffusion with music. Our state of the art right now is like music gen, um, and also like audio LDM, and like uh, some yeah some other ones. Uh, Har Harmony, we we haven't dropped our large model yet, but later in the year. Um, like w once you have these base model, like what what can you do? Can you uh, if if your paradigm is is latent diffusion, you can borrow all of the ideas that. Ha, like people have been doing as, with stable fusion for the last year and, and apply that to a music diffusion model. Um, there's all these cool fine tuning techniques like Dream Booth and um, textual inversion and now like Hyper Dream Booth. Um, there's L LoRa's. Uh, I th if you're in neural synthesis, I highly recommend, uh, in, in, yeah, in your, you know, into the diffusion side of the paradigm and not necessarily the language model type of paradigm. I definitely like get super super familiar with how people are using distribution for image, because um, all of those techniques are are useful. Um, cool inference research that I'm currently working on is like in painting, in, like infilling. If you have a song, you erase the middle of it, and you want to make something new uh, to fill that void. Or if you have two completely different songs, and you want to generate a transition between them. Um, how do you do that? And uh, diffusion is really cool. I wish I had more visuals um, because it's all like you know, cutting edge stuff. Uh, diff diffusion is really nice, and I like it a lot better than language models because of this iterative uh, noise schedule process. Um, it like gives you a whole another dimension to create algorithms for. So like for example, you can do in painting by like ch like ch changing the the window. The mask, changing the size of your mask um, throughout the, the schedule, um, and just like coming up with different ways to do that, gets you different sort of in, uh, in painting effects. Um, and also, one of the hugest problems with music is getting 
like a safe data set that is large enough to sound good. Um, a lot of these big industry researchers like OpenAI and Google, they have music models that like internally they've trained on all the copyright music in the world um, that they'll never release. And it sounds great. Um, and then, uh, then like if you're, if you, yeah, if you, if you want to make something you actually want to release and you don't want to try to get into, into trouble by releasing a model like that because it's not licensed, then you're like, okay, what, what can I do with Creative Commons, CC BY, CC0, kind of data sets, free sound, free music archive. Um, and there's just not enough of it. Um, so this, you train the same model on all that stuff, and it just doesn't sound as good. So that's kind of an interesting problem. And you know, what can we do there? Can we col like work together to collect more music that can be used for generative data sets? Um, have some kind of like artist opt-in or like find large libraries that are, are willing to contribute in that way? Um, or this other realm of like, how, you know, how far can we take reinforcement learning? Can we get enough human feedback with RLHF to improve a model that was, has only been trained on free sound, for example? Um, so yeah, on the language model paradigm, we have MusicLM and MusicGen, which are currently state of the art there. And in the continuous VIE realm, latent diffusion is state of the art. And um, it sounds great. Like here is just 48 kilohertz death metal trained on this, well, this one band that we work with latent, using the latent diffusion. It just sounds great. Um, <laughs> these speakers aren't very good, but <laughs> trust me, that's 48 kilohertz. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so you don't have to use diffusion in a latent space. It makes it really fast, fast to train, fast for inference. But also, you can do uh, latent. Uh, you can do diffusion in just the raw audio space. And so we, re we released a model last year called Dance Diffusion, where you can do that. Um, and it's really good for sound production. Uh, if I want to make bleeps and bloops or gabber kicks like this one. Letting the diffusion happen on the waveform process, um, it's just awesome for uh, making electronic music. Um, yeah, there's the tutorials and stuff. Uh, an <laughs> so another <laughs> really fun thing to do with text prompted music generation is that text can be your input. And you can do fun things like make a bot that responds to this other bot. So this is a Twitter bot called This Band Isn't Real. And every day, they put out a fake album, the album art, and the text for artist and album. And so that can be input to a diffusion model. <laughs> and like this one. So it, it sounds surprisingly good. It's um, even just giving the name of an artist like Maniacal Colossus, it's, it seems to understand the mission. Uh, versus something like Wizard's Hammer, it's going to make power metal. So yeah, there's just so much information, even just in a band name, that's able to pick up. Um, I know a lot of you love, love doing rave. You can do latent diffusion in rave. Um, Audio LDM2 just came out, and they figured out a bunch of inference tricks to make it 13 times faster. 
Um, and there's also, yeah, Fl uh, Flavia Schneider's audio diffusion research. Uh, and then there's Refusion, which instead of generating audio, it generates a MEL spectrogram, which gets then, with stable diffusion, which then uh, gets inverted back into audio. Um, these are all cool places to start. Uh, yeah, infilling <laughs> is, yeah, well, what, one of the things that it's great about diffusion is being able to do infilling for audio. Um, we aren't seeing this yet infilling with, for language models based music synthesis, but you could, you could do it. Um, I just, I think the diffusion is a lot further away, further along. Um, here is an interface I started working on for just like how we, one would do like in painting. So um, here I'd be like, all right, you know, give me something new in the middle. Uh, here is like continuation. We're out painting forward, or you can go backwards, <laughs> generate in reverse, uh, create variation by noising 50% and then denoising, um, or you know, take two different, completely different audio files and then make some sort of transition between them. It was really fun. Um, and another really, really cool thing about uh, diffusion models is control net. So if you have a large base model that has, it's already been trained with some kind of conditioning, like text. Um, and normally, if you wanna, wanted to add new conditioning, you would have to train it again. Uh, control net is a way to just graft on new conditioning. And we're seeing this with stable diffusion where people can make like, hook on an edge detector, train a control net, ho hook it onto stable diffusion, and now you can condition images based on their edge. So you could give it the edge of, a, of like a portrait. So you take an image, get, take, get the edge, condition that with control net, and now you're generating images that, have, that fit that edge. And so with music, um, this is great news because you can just throw all the really, really cool MIR stuff at it. Um, you could have chromogram control nets to control the melody the polyphony of your generation. You can have tempograms and onset envelope control nets to control the rhythm. You can ha create sets of constraints that are as specific or general as you want. Um, and this is, this is why like, the diffusion paradigm of neural synthesis I think is more exciting um, currently uh, because of, of the promise of all this stuff. And if you're an MIR researcher, and maybe feeling left out, you're like, ah, oh, I, I wish I was working on um, neurosynthesis, uh, and but like, you know, I don't have a thousand GPUs to train a model. Um, control nets train really fast. Um, like just seeing how the, the stable diffusion community using automatic 11.11 has just continually put out new extensions and plugins that are control net based. Um, just shows just how accessible it is. Uh, and yeah, this is just gonna be really fun. Okay, so I am now come to the end of my talk. In conclusion, Chaos GPT is trying to destroy humanity. Uh, the end is near. We have merch. <laughs> and we're Databots. Thank you. Uh, this is now the time for questions. In the back. Um, this is probably, I don't know what the, the state of the, what the situation is in Europe. Hmm. If you can help with my accent, I'm uh, from Washington, D.C. Hmm. And in Washington, D.C., this question is very close to our country. Hmm. Um, how much is this with copyright? Oh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I know that's not a concern to me, but the AOD would be free. Uh, hmm. Hmm. 
Um, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's very complex and seems that there are. One sec. Uh, oh. Could you repeat a little bit the question? I'll sorry. repeat the question. Oh. For the people who's online. Totally. Yeah, the question was about copyright and if I have any opinions on copyright. And I, I, I really don't know. It's like a chaotic storm of different opinions clashing. And um, it's really divided. And I guess I, um, we're just going to have to see how, how it evolves. I, it's hard to predict. Um, but I, I, I guess if I were to have an opinion, I would hope that it would be something that balances all the different kinds of creativity here. And I would hope that every kind of creator had a voice and seat at the table as this was being uh, drafted, and, you know, including uh, you know, musicians from major labels, independent musicians, remix artists, um, and musicians who are not just using it as their tool, using AI as their tool, but where AI is like the main focus. Um, and yeah, that's all I got. Any other questions? Wow, yeah, what, what a great question. So what is my measure of quality? And um, yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> I, I suppose you know, everyone has a different music taste. And that's one of the beautiful things about music. That's why every noise has 5,000 genres. And they all sound way different. Um, I think what's interesting is like using your taste as your, the thing which is creating. Uh, and we're, we're seeing this now with experiments with RLPF, re reinforcement learning with personal feedback. Uh, and with as little as like 100 iterations of, OK, here's a bunch of stuff I generated. Like, what was your favorite? And you're like, are these? And you're like, OK, fine tune for a minute. Repeat. Do that 100 times. Then the, the model uh, like narrows down to your personal preference. And th like uh, Samim calls this like wireheading. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I think that's really, really interesting. Like, wh what happens if you hook Rick Rubin up to this? <laughs> like, um, or like, a, you know, a, what happens when you like take young children that have not yet been influenced by their peers and their culture musically, and you just let them explore? Like, do I like A or B? And over the course of um, a bunch of iterations of that, what do, what do you get? Um, so, I don't know, me, me personally, my, my, I like fast, complex ADHD music. I don't know. <laughs> Can you hmm. maybe turn it in a way that would be more, uh, for lack of a better word, coherent for a fellow musician? Hmm. Uh, can, can you help me understand better what makes you feel satisfied of, of certain music that's created? Mm. Oh, t yeah, um, oh, yeah, I don't know, something that like, is pushing what music can be. Um, I, I mean, I like things from yeah, the very fast and extreme, obviously, like break core and death metal. I also like, th like the multi-genre mashups of like Mr. Bungle and John Zorn. I like um, the, f the complexity of like math core. And Steve Reich, just n patterns upon patterns of patterns. That's just me personally. I like that. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you for the presentation. That's really, really great. Because I learned a lot. My question is uh, about it's coming from the um, SPS and the Pathetic uh, methodology together. And now it's the Bongo. Hmm. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, very interesting. Um, um, well, I, I think m musicians have a long history of, oh, sorry. <laughs> the question is, how do I decide what I make visible or not, particularly in response to like the training data? And, and I think musicians have a long history of like talking up their influences. And even if you go on allmusic.com, you can see who influenced who, who influenced who. And, and it, you don't even have to be explicit. If you're like a big enough music nerd, you'll hear that and you're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's definitely like, you know, giant steps in there and John Coltrane. Um, or like, oh yeah, it's definitely Dillinger Escape Plan in there. Um, and I guess with now, um, with, yeah, th with the example of Fr Frank Sinatra and Britney Spears that I was using Jukebox and that has seen 5,000, like thousands of, it's seen thousands of artists in there. Um, then, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. That's, that's yeah, I guess it's a hard, hard, hard question. Um, could you be more specific? Um, isn't there a problem that we track the internet? Oh, sure. Um, well, I think if you're, well, the safe way to make a model is use all licensed or opt-in data, and that's currently our paradigm for the Harmony, releasing these base models that are safe and all consent-based. Um, but you know, also, there's this long history of people on the internet making remixes on SoundCloud, and DJs, we all accept DJs can like, make remixes of artists live and we all party to that. Um, so these like two different thoughts of how, you know, how this should work. It's just, yeah, it's still an open question and more solutions are definitely should be out there. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think if you're, if you're just an indie creator, like, you know, why not, why not ex experiment and, and share what you're making? But if you're making a bunch of money on it, on it then you should be th thinking more like about what's fair money wise. Uh, and, but I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't really, I don't really know. Any other, yeah, question? Oh, um, what's been struggling the, for the most of the moment? For, the, for a while, it was electronic music it was really bad at, which was always counterintuitive, because you're like, oh, of course it's gonna be great at electronic music. Like, no, it's not. But now it is starting to get there. Um, and actually, it's kind of interesting seeing a model as it trains, like these large models as it trains. So the f uh, if it's an audio-based model, the first thing it gets is drums and bass. Um, it gets transients and low frequencies, it nails it. So actually, it starts getting electronic music like right away, like drum and bass, dubstep does it really well. Uh, and, but then the thing it struggles with is more like polyphony. Uh, so then, the longer you train it, then you know, at, at, like at first, you might even it might even not even do voices. Like ra rave models tend to like if you train it on rap, it just takes the rapper out of it. Um, one thing I, I think was like using the uh, the like a weighting, so like boost the, the mids, and that helps bring the the uh, vo vocals back in, but um, you might train it on like prog rock and it doesn't even give you any uh, like leads, it just kind of gives you this backing track at first and then you train it longer, then it gets the polyphony. So um, I think two components of it, one, the, f the fidelity, getting really, really good fidelity for every kind of generation is really hard, uh, this, this side, you know, getting the complexities of music rhythmically and melodically. And I think, you know, even adding in control net might solve that. Um, and then I think the, th in the frontier beyond that is generating good mixes. Uh, so if you listen to like some excellent producers like Tipper and you on headphones, you're just like in transported to this th three dimensional world uh, where everything is just perfectly in its place and nothing out of neurosynthesis sounds like that yet. Um, we don't, there's no, we're not using loss functions that are like mix aware and like what would that even look like? Um, like 
stereo widening source separation based loss functions, like what would that be? I'm, I haven't heard of any of that, anything like that, NMIR. Maybe you have. Um, so designing some kind of loss autoencoder that's aware of that, that can recreate mixes as, as good as like tippers, I think is another really cool frontier. Oh, a question is about the inspiration uh, about the live streaming. Um, so I'm re really in, into this genre called mathcore, where it's like they are writing the songs to maximize surprise at every moment. It, it comes from a history coming from punk music to hardcore music, and then mathcore, you're just trying to maximize the surprise the whole time. But after listening to a record like that dozens of times, all the surprise goes away, because now I've memorized it. And I kept thinking, like, like, how can I get back that, that emotion of surprise that I felt on the first few times I listened to that record? It's like, oh, well, if you, if you had algorithmic music that was statistical, then it could always be constantly surprising. And that eventually led me to the neural, like, live stream medium. Because now it can be constantly surprising. Uh, so that's, yeah, one, one reason that I use those. I'll say again? Oh, do I, do I think it was, it, um, that was successful? I, th um, I, th I think something that we make is successful if it makes me laugh. If I'm like cracking up while listening to it, then, <laughs> then I, we did a good job. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, th those have been making me laugh. So I think, I think it's successful, but I also think like the, the ceiling of it is just like even, way even higher, and I'll, you know, I'll be doing this my whole life. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think this is the, the best thing that could be happening to music, is an existential threat to music. Um, and Mike Patton has this quote uh, where uh, it's like, um, uh, com computers are, you said this in like the early 90s, computers are important for music because computers are more messed up than people, and the more messed up and further away music gets from music, the healthier it is for music. And I couldn't agree more. Um, like cha challenging our notions of what music is uh, is like only going to make music better for all of us. Um, I'll rephrase my question. Yeah. How, how do uh, humans uh, maintain their value proposition in a world where AI is less important? And also hmm. in a world where these same AIs are often trained on the pieces that they replace. Right. Okay, so the question is, how, how can humans maintain their value proposition in a world with AI music? Um, and so, very good question. What do we mean by values? And if we're talking about getting paid for work, I think a lot about how the music industry is only 100 years old, and music itself has been part of humanity and part of the biosphere for millions of years and longer and serves many other purposes, um, like mating <laughs> and communicating and socializing and group dynamics and having peak experiences um, and cathartically processing our emotions and therapy. 
Uh, so yeah, music has been a tool for our own health. You look, go to music therapy conferences, go to neuroscience of music conferences, all the evidence is there. Um, I think it seems like the path that generative media is taking us is when it, it is so easy and ubiquitous for us to create content, as easy as it is talking, then it just becomes the way we talk. Um, and that's pretty cool. <laughs> Does that make sense? Oh, so is your question is, will there just be one large music model? Yeah, I can do all the things like salt saturation, saturation, hmm. and filling, and uh, how to manage something, yeah. Oh, yeah, good question. Um, I don't think there'll be one, one model to rule them all. Uh, like, each model has its own personality, which is interesting, and it's interesting to ex explore um, <laughs> models that aren't even necessarily good at most things, but ha like have their own approach. Like the like the latent based models are good for the large models when you want to combine genres. But then if you're coming up with like new kinds of synthesis, you want the amp like the amplitude sequence based models. Um, and even models themselves aren't one model. Like a, like a music diffusion model has clap, which it comes up with the text music embedding. It has VAE, um, control nets, like it's extensions, things are being like stuck, stuck on. And it's more like le Lego blocks. Um, and as also as a music producer, I'm like moving between models. Maybe I want to use an autoregressive model because it has this concept of temperature. And that's cool for making like surprise and things that move forward in time. But then for diffusion, because it has this like parallel window. Uh, it's like better at keeping time, and it's just like two different things. So I, the same way that we have guitars and bass and drums and cello and all these different things. Same with uh, neural synthesis models. I don't. Yeah, the the zoo. There'll be a, the 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 zoo of models. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. And I too share your optimism about hmm. how AI can benefit musicians. Hmm. Um, I'm really interested in perhaps you ripping out the roadmap to take that human adversarial network. Hmm. What's left to do? Certainly with Route 1, hmm. we seem to be getting a lot from it, but okay. where could we go if that was a new place to go? That, uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, and th this is related to, uh, I got to meet Grimes recently, that was pretty cool. And she, uh, she had an opinion on this too. She was like, um, I, I get that the human adversarial learning, like, like these kinds of things are push, you know, raising the ceiling for musicians, but like the top 10% of musicians, like the top 10, and not just even for music, but like think about all like ChatGPT and all, all kinds of models. The top 10% of people are like autodidacts. They're going to teach themselves. They're going to use this to um, you know, improve themselves. But then what, you know, what about the, the remaining 90% of People that, given a shortcut, they'll take it. You know, they'll just reach inside the cookie jar and grab the cookie instead of working for the reward. Um, and her fear is that humans atrophy in their learning. Um, and so, yeah, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we're already seeing this with music that the advent of the popularity of DJing as a, per, as a profession, uh, it's like you can make a lot more money playing, being a DJ than as playing in, in instruments in a band. So maybe fewer people are playing instruments. Um, and maybe, um, yeah, I don't know. L yeah, a lot, a lot of questions there. Your uh, question was about 
the human adversarial learning and how, how does this make us all better? I think maybe what's even more interesting is the like teacher, the music teacher, which you know at a very very young age, I feel like as a toddler age, like you're able to play with something that is giving you the music skills to develop very quickly and is like able to li listen and you can play with it and it keeps you in that flow state. Um, so I think like interactive, like one-on-one -on -one teaching that's driven by machine learning seems, seems to be the thing that's really cool in that regard. This is a follow-up, sorry to yeah. the whole here. Yeah. Mm. Um, Right, yeah, right, yeah, we, yeah, we have a max patch for that. Um, and, and also, there's like the, the longer cycle where, you know, we take a couple days to, to, to fine tune train it, then he listens to it, then he makes up a new data set responding to that, fine tune train it, and that's like, you know, we, weekly cycles. <laughs> hmm. Chris. Hmm. I'm guessing you meet a lot of people who get inspired by neurosynthesis and want to go and do some stuff in, in, themselves. Hmm. So there's quite a high barrier to entry. Uh, hmm. You can't, it's not like you can just pick up a guitar and start making hmm. some noise. Uh, is hmm. there, do you see any ways that there's maybe a chance for a bit more of a kind of punk ethic and hmm. neurosynthesis that, that lets people just start making music a bit more easily? Hmm. Yeah, good, good question. Um, uh, if, what, what's the punk ethos of neurosynthesis? I think we're we're slowly figuring what out, figuring that out. Um, the like, you can go in hugging face and text prompt music gen right now. I guess that's like the easiest barrier. You just weigh in, um, and even like even that's addicting. Like I would spend like 30 hours in a week just prompting, prompting, prompting combinations of genres, like speed, intensity, adding mood words, just trying to search the latent space. Um, and then ha having like audio prompting also, like find me more things that sound like this. Let me, let's explore what, what else is there. Like humming, beatbox input, let's build, build on that. Um, I guess that's kind of like the, <laughs> like, the like I, didn't, I didn't go to school to learn my instrument kind of approach um, of, to making music, which, you know, popularized, or it was like, yeah, just punk bands playing in, in their garage or in their basement, or, or like doing, but then like finding the aesthetics with, within that, I don't know, I th it feels like we're like on the verge of t like lots of people getting, getting into it, like, cause it's, it is addicting and the, the models are like almost at that point where um, like you, like the, the average, uh, um, People on mid-journey, like the, a lot of them are gamers that are now spending their hours they would have spent gaming now on mid-journey, um, and like that's almost about to happen for music. And so I, I feel, I feel like, I, yeah, I feel like it'd be like that. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, safe as in the data set was licensed or like Creative Commons, public domain, or consent opt-in. Um, safe as in safe from the threat of litigation. Um, and like when you have a safe model, then musicians and startups can feel comfortable 
you know, building off of that. Um, and yeah, there's no, there isn't like clarity if you're trying to do, trying to write like a fair use argument by training it on things that aren't, were copyrighted. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's complicated. So um, what I mean by sound good, uh, I, like I think ha ha yeah, having better better metrics like mean opinion score for generative models and what people generally think of sounds good. I don't know. I'm just riding my gut here, but just co like comparing if you train it on, on like a bunch of good music, it sounds really good, and if you train it on all the free music, it doesn't quite sound as good. And yeah, that is a whole research direction of like how can we make this sound equally as good. As, as this. Well, just finally, hmm. to expand on that and then sort of the notion of space, and I'll just like take hmm. you through and break it into a really hmm. succinct answer to a very difficult question. Hmm. Oh, true. Um, like, yeah, different kinds of cultural safety. Like, for example, if you have a lyric condition model, I think all of the general concepts of safety that we look might look to in a language model would also apply, probably. That's the first thing I think of. Um, and there's probably more things were still undiscovered. Um, but it seems an interesting direction. Okay, everyone, I think it's time to mm. give the session. Uh, first of all, thank you mm. for the talk. And I think yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So I invite you, if you have more questions, I think uh, we can just chill in a, a, with a beer or something outside. Mm. Uh, and I invite Chris mm. <laughs> to finish the session. Mm.